Hello, welcome to another episode of Square Peg Podcast. Have you seen in this podcast in the earlier episodes, we are trying to bring in neurodiverse learners who are in the grad school who made it and who made it to a PhD program or they just graduated with the highest degree they received the PhD. And the purpose is showcasing some of those that they are considered square pegs, uh, misfits. Maybe we don't want to go that far, but those that they are non-traditional in our education system. We want to talk to them and give them a platform to share their experiences with us. What we can achieve from that is, first of all, I mean, some reflection. We talk about our past experiences. If there is any learning for our educators and education system today that can make it a little easier path for neurodiverse learners, non-traditional learners, and also for listeners out there that they are in their undergrad years and they're facing challenges. They think they don't belong. They think they should give up. They tried everything. And I hope really listening to conversations that we are presenting to you during this podcast help someone out there and make them rethink about where they are, what they are doing, and hopefully we can put some of those struggles in context for them, some of the challenges. And I want to also thank uh, the National Science Foundation for supporting this effort. This is an outreach activity that we are doing as part of a funded research project that we are running. And the purpose of that is to understand the experience of neurodiverse learners in graduate education. Today, I'm talking to Catherine Fleck, and she is a PhD student in molecular and cell biology, a second year PhD student, and I'm very excited to be with you today. And uh, I thank you very much for taking the time, agreeing to be with us. I really hope we can have two-way conversation. The purpose of this is not for me to interview you. It is for us to have a conversation about our experiences. And hopefully, using this unstructured framework, there are points, there are experiences that we can discuss from the past that is helpful to our audience. Thank you again for being with me today. Absolutely. What is your motivation to be here today? Right. Well, so I am career-wise thinking of going into teaching or academia in the first place. And it's really important to me for students at whatever level to realize that there are other people like them and students around the world. But also, like, I have many, many younger cousins that in all likelihood will have some amount of challenge in their own schooling and all of that. And it's important to me that they see that they can do whatever they want education-wise, however far they want to go. I'm the first person in my family to go for a full PhD. There are other doctors in my family, but they're physical therapists or MD doctors. Um, pursuing graduate school as an academia graduate school is new for mm -hmm. people in my family. And I want them to see that it's still doable and possible to, and all of that. To, to some extent is personal. Oh you. yeah. Um and I've made a lot more peace with myself and having ADHD and, and neurodiversity, especially through college and even now still at three or four years post college, but being comfortable in who I am and how my brain works. And I think it's important to be open about that part of me because yeah. it's an integral to how I view the world. Absolutely right. And how I function as a person. And I, I don't want to bury that. So I don't know if I've just gone very far to the other extreme. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think so. But it's, I've definitely made a lot more efforts in the last several years to just talk about it more as it is a huge aspect of my reality. And that's no different from anybody talking about their own reality. And, and when you think about that, there is no reason, good reason out there for us to hide it other than somehow sometime the past a stigma formed around it right yeah and then like it fell under the category of some people they took it as far as mental disease or things like that yeah and, um, mm -hmm. and no one wants to present him or herself as 
deficient person. So we right. tend to hide our deficiencies. Yeah. And also for me as a female there and ADHD, there was a whole bunch of does it even exist in girls? And diagnosing in women and especially in young girls is so much harder to get done. It's getting better, but girls with ADHD don't present in nearly the same way as young boys do on the average. And so I really want to help with like it is still there, and it's also not something that goes away out of, out into adulthood. It's it'll be around for the rest of my life. Um, I know there's a huge amount of women who are now realizing, oh, all of these things about my childhood now make so much more sense because the qualities that teachers and parents look for is by and large governed by what it looks like in boys, and so that's also important to me. Of that's, that's very important, and you're not the first person who tells me that. Uh, I've had the opportunity of working with multiple mm -hmm. neurodiverse uh, girls, and somehow kids, I mean boys uh, particularly, they are understood that it is normal to be non-traditional or do crazy things. Right. There is this unreasonable, unjustified expectations. No, but uh, girls behave. Yeah, girls. I mean, like, don't say things that are out of context or don't interrupt. I mean, like, all of those cultural assumptions. Right. When we talk about critical theories, mm -hmm. at its core, it is talking about the power dynamic mm -hmm. that these implicit assumptions, yeah, form, and that power dynamic is toxic. It, mm -hmm. it leads to further suppression of that marginalized group. Absolutely, yeah. And it can also harmfully affect boys as well. Um, it's not just, you know, the idea that boys will be boys, but then when boys don't fit into what boys usually do, then that's also problematic. Yeah, it's not good for anybody. Yeah. Um, the sort of expectations that, and there, it's starting so young now, I feel like, of kid children in kindergarten are expected to sit and attend class and blah, blah, blah. And if four-year-olds aren't meant, four or five-year-olds are not meant to sit still that long. But, yeah. And so it doesn't make any sense to me that you would expect them to when, you know, 40 years ago, we didn't expect them to. Nothing yeah. changes. Yeah. It's a great place for us to start talking about your elementary school experiences. So Particularly, I want you to touch on a vivid memory of your time back then, something that stayed with you, that un maybe even unknowingly has shaped some of the beliefs that you have about yourself today. I mean, like, give, give us a sense of your overall experience <laughs> when you were in elementary school, and then get to some specific episodes that stayed with you. Right. Oh, so... I, one of the things that definitely shaped my school, and I went to an all-girls school. The only year that I went to school with boys was seventh grade. That definitely is a different atmosphere for most schooling. And most of what I remember elementary school being is like, I had almost different friends every year because my parents very much believed in children having after-school activities, but all of my after-school activities were not connected to the school that I went to. So I had school friends and then outside of school friends mm. at whatever activity. I think I definitely probably struggled to make friends and like be comfortable with keeping them. Um, why? Why was that so? You know, I don't know or remember too much. I remember you'd go to school for the school year and then the summer would happen. And then girls that I had been friends with the previous year had new interests now and were doing other things or had made good friends with somebody else over the summer when I wasn't seeing them. I don't really remember what I used to do over the summers in elementary school now, but we were not, not the type of family to go on vacation somewhere for the whole summer. We did camps and stuff like that. We were always pretty much kept active. I mean, I also had two younger siblings. And so when there's three kids and you outnumber your parents, you're definitely put into stuff to occupy yeah. your time. Yeah. Um, my sister and I did all the same pretty much activities outside of school but I remember like doing things like soccer and stuff and not able to quickly make friends with people and then not feeling like I could play soccer well because you know people wouldn't pass the ball to me or whatever and I never clicked with people well in elementary school I don't think or at least not that I really remember I'm not close with anybody from elementary school anymore 
Um, How about inside the school, uh, like in the classroom setting? What was your feeling? What what comes up when you think of that time? Right. So most of the stuff that I remember from like schooling is like dreading timed tests, the timed math tables tests where you'd get like a hundred problems on a sheet and you have I don't know three minutes to do them or something, and feeling confident when I did it and then realizing that I'd done the wrong math for, you know, 10% of them or something. And spelling tests were a nightmare. Mm. I remember sitting down at the kitchen table with my mom practicing spelling words and like it's having exact word, and it's yeah, nice that I had. having the same word five times in five different spellings. Yeah. But I knew which one was right. I just didn't ever go back and double check myself well. But I definitely I was a big reader um in elementary school and I remember like being chastised because it's bedtime and I'm under my bed sheets with a flashlight reading a book. I remember well past bed, what should have been bedtime, being so upset by the end of a book that I went and cried to my mom of like, it's not fair, blah, blah, blah. I definitely read a lot and was probably decently above reading level. Uh, was it acknowledged or appreciated in your classroom setting? Well, so my school. Part of what made it different, my class sizes were so much smaller that it, that sort of individually of like where a student is, is academically was able to be managed by the teachers. But it's also like pretty much everybody was expected to be at least somewhat above grade level. And I wasn't diagnosed at this point. So I wasn't in any sort of like special education help or anything like that. So everything, I was just in the normal classroom. So did you make any troubles or did you put yourself in troubles yeah. frequently or any time that you know not that i really remember being like scolded by teachers yeah. or something like that i have things that i remember doing i remember we were taking like a state standardized test and they would move everybody's desks away from each other and i ended up like with my desk shoved up against a, a push pin board and I don't know if I had already finished or was just bored out of my mind, but I pulled a whole bunch of the push pins out of the board. And then when we had to go give the test back to the teacher, I put them in my chair, proceeded to forget I had put them in my chair and then sat on them. In, not even like 30 seconds later. But like, <laughs> I, I, so I don't, I definitely remember doing small things like that. That was probably third Very or fourth big grade. Or a little bit for a procrastinator. A little bit. But again, I don't remember there being a whole lot to procrastinate about then. Um, homework was very much, you know, worksheets. I, oh, I do remember definitely procrastinating. Like we would have book report, like shoebox dioramas and stuff like that. I think my mom definitely was on top of making yeah. sure I was on top of things a lot more than, than as, you know, my younger siblings also got into school and then juggling all three of us. And it is interesting. I, I take a quick pause here. Mm -hmm. I've talked to many parents in the past few years and because again, they love their kids. They want to make sure they succeed. They start filling those gaps by right. kind of like, okay, you don't need to remember everything. Mm -hmm. I will do that remembering for you. I will let you know where the time comes. I yeah. mean, like for something, I mean, like, and it is, it is critical. I mean, like it essentially they take a charge of some of the executive function right. of the kid. And some, they organically adjust it based on the needs, what is important, but some, they keep it at that kind of existential level that like, do you remember that, right. that you see that kind of like micromanagement of their kids time, even when they are in college. And that is, it's convenient for the kids, but like, I mean, if it is healthy or not, I is open to more kind of like yeah. discussion. I think it is. Uh, I'm not saying that at some point they have to be let alone by themselves to figure it out, but it shouldn't be to a, to an extent that doesn't picture, it doesn't let the kid see the reality of the life right. and challenges because yeah. building a thick skin, mm -hmm. remembering, forgetting the homework and being kind of like, again, I don't know, uh, criticized or that. I mean, like, you need to build some resilience also. Right, definitely. And there are some kids that they are, again, like, so protected by their parents that they don't get to build that immunity, essentially. Yeah. And definitely by the time I was into, like, high school, my parents, and so a lot of it came from my mom. My mom, at that point in time, was a high school teacher, and she's, her entire career has been in, you know, high school education, 
into now college counseling. But so I definitely, the amount of you have to keep your grades up and all of that was felt a lot more from my mom because she lived that life every day, both professionally and then with us. But I would never say that they were so micromanaging to where like I didn't face consequences for stuff because definitely by high school, I didn't turn stuff in and had problems and consequences from that. The The pressure to perform well was definitely there for as far back as I can really remember. What was it, I think, anxiety feels? I wouldn't go that far. At times, probably, yes. Not generally to, like, a, a whole other aspects of my life, but... And for a long time, I would say no, not really, because I did generally perform well. And I, into middle school and stuff, was in what would qualify as gifted programs and things yeah. like that. And I am academically intelligent in some areas more than others but i do remember especially with the subjects that i didn't do well in languages and uh english class and yeah. stuff like that when you'd have to take stuff home to get because you didn't do well on a test my school would say you have to get it signed by a parent i would always take it to my dad because dad wouldn't make comments um, i remember i hit one of those that they needed signature on if there was a spelling test and this grade was out of 20. I yep. got minus 23. I had 46. <laughs> no. So it was, uh, I was hiding it for a long time. And somehow my mom got to find it. And every time I was coming up with an excuse, oh, why I forgot to bring it again? Because right. the teacher was asking, like, yeah. did you get that signed? And again, like, uh, probably I developed some storytelling skills yeah. right there. <laughs> right. Page. And then my mom found it, found it, and um, I mean, somehow the reaction wasn't as bad I, uh, as I anticipated, but it wasn't that, oh, nice, Arash. I mean, like, work harder next time. I mean, like, there was some consequence for that, yeah. and yeah, that was challenging. Right. I re so a uh, thing that I did that I will always remember in fifth grade, I, w I was taking Spanish, and I cheated on a Spanish test. I... Um, wrote down one of the verbs and how it gets conjugated on a little slip of paper and took it into the test and used it and then I was like so not smart about the cheating in the first place like threw it in the trash watching another student watch me throw this piece of paper in the trash the whole deal got called into the principal's office all of that I'm sure they called my mom when my mom picked me up that day I remember sitting in the back of our van looking at my mom in the rearview mirror so what happened at school today in immediate tears of like I can't hold on to this <laughs> like I've done something terrible and I don't even remember like what my parents did about it now but I remember sobbing in the back of the van to my mom in the driver's seat and I asked her once she was like I don't remember you doing that it's very interesting I mean I, I really want to kind of unpack mm -hmm. some underlying concepts on it yeah so we're talking about a fifth grader girl yeah sitting in the back of that van sobbing because the feeling of guilt and shame. Right. Yeah, definitely. What did you do wrong? Nothing. If you just like think about that. Yeah. They ask you to do something mm -hmm. that you thought that it's not your thing or easy for you or like even if you work hard, you're not. And then you decided to get some assistance of some sort yeah. by helping yourself right. uh, to essentially fix that disadvantage that you have. Mm hmm compared to many others that they may read it for the first time and memorize it. Yeah. Because what I did, I cheated a few times actually, and it was always a list of names that I had to memorize or yeah. dates mm -hmm. of like in history exams. I mean, like dates of things. I mean, I had right. to write. There was no physical way for me to memorize that. And yeah. I tried to essentially the same way that, for example, now we have captions mm -hmm. for those that they have difficulties like hearing or like for any other reason. Is it cheating? No. No. It's accommodation. Yeah. Right? So yeah. we were provide we were we we're provide if you do it across the board mm -hmm. on all the topics every time, that's unethical. Right. But if it is one subject and one aspect of that subject and is consistent, I mean like if every exam doesn't matter if it is math, if it is like literature you take some notes mm -hmm. with you yeah. then that's unethical i mean you're not like helping yourself learn honestly right. by by knowing that there is a shortcut but 
if you're across the board, you're studying, you're ethical, you're working, you're taking the time to prepare for an exam, and there is one part those days, there's no way I can remember them without mixing them, confusing yeah. them. And th I don't want to be penalized. So you accommodated right. yourself, yeah. and then you were feeling that shame and guilt. I think this is a fundamental problem with our education system. Well, and something that I've had more and more thought towards is how much memorization is pushed in, you know, elementary into most of the American school system and how that doesn't reflect on what people do with their jobs in the real world. Anytime that I don't remember something, I go and look it up. Yeah. I'm expected to. And that's true for almost any profession. Yes, there is some subset of knowledge that you should know right off the bat that's tailored to what you do. Yes. But if a doctor isn't sure about something, they go and look it up because it's more important to be right than show that you've got everything memorized. And I think that should sort of trickle down to some extent, at least in our school system of there is no reason that a student should have to memorize the periodic table or whatever, because nobody does in real life and their job. They look at it. I think that so much memorization is detrimental to a lot of students, regardless of neurodivergencies or whatever. And it's not an accurate reflection of what the job market looks like. And therefore, I don't think that it's necessary to... Why do you them. think they are focusing on that i have a theory for that i don't want I, yeah. I, I i want to know your opinion first i don't know if i have so much of a, a theory per se but i do think i was reading something not too long ago about how the school system compared to how old the united states is is very new the idea of educating everybody to some set standard is a new idea yes education is critically important in all of that but i don't know that it is accurate to say that every student in the United States should be educated in all subject areas to the same level by high school or whatever. And I think it's done almost a, a disservice to a lot of students because of how much we've downplayed things like trade schools or jobs that don't require extensive chemistry knowledge or whatever, yeah. like, which are all perfectly good and valid and needed jobs. But you don't have to know, you know Shakespearean literature or all of those kinds of things that every student is taught pretty much because some entity has told them that they have to learn it. I think there's still a lot of trial and error in how education should work and to what extent should you educate everybody. Yeah. And I do think it's that, important still. That's very important. And and what you're saying or suggesting is absolutely right. I can see that that, that is one of the reasons that there is this tendency to do cookie cutter stuff, um, like asking people to memorize. My, my, what I want to add to that is though, we should be very careful that what we do, what we are doing makes sense. Sometimes it is just because of its convenience. Right. For example, like in, it's very easy to teach a science topic mm -hmm. just by asking students to memorize things. What's the definition of this? What's the, how many types of this? we have or what's the function of like this part of the cell and just all memorization rather than making sure we are forming a picture for students right and it helps them to refine their mental model of the world yeah rather than just archiving these things i mean in the book i mean like how many times we go to our library and like we pick something to i mean it's just uh, it's it may happen once in a while that we need to go to our references, but it's not that every time I come to my office, I open my all, all of the books in my library. Right. So that is not that critical that some may think it is, yeah. honestly, as you said. I mean, like when you go to upper and upper level, like PhD program, then if we just like go with the same projection, then the expectation is you have to memorize more things now. I yeah. bet you don't even memorize anything anymore. No. And... That lack of understanding of what the real life is expecting us. There is a huge mismatch between what we tell students is important mm -hmm. and what is actually important and yeah. relevant. Right. And that's fine. We do a lot of like irrelevant. We play video games with no yeah. and so We do a lot of like things that you, if you really think you're thinking, ask yourself, why do we do that? There's yeah. nothing productive about this. We do a lot of those things, but this particular one, a wrong view, a wrong attitude toward education is harmful. Yeah, absolutely. It's like adding toxins to food. 
Yeah. It's making people anxious, a lot of like depression and like a lot of long-term impact on self-confidence of individuals. It's as if I go to a restaurant and I expect to get some food that doesn't make me sick. Yeah. Isn't that the very basic expectation? Yeah. We, we send our kids to school with the expectation that they grow, they become better people and they come back sick. Yeah. Well, and I think people forget of like how much school is now taking over kids' life. They go to school for eight hours a day and then they come home and now they have, you know, however many hours of homework to do. And I feel like, especially in high school and stuff, teachers aren't recognizing how much homework they each individually give and how quickly that adds up. But then there's also so much pressure for students to keep up with things outside of school because their resume needs to look good or whatever. Because in my generation, we're all told that you need to go to college. And in order to get into college now, you have to have X, Y, Z, good grades, all this other stuff, student, government, blah, blah, blah. Yes. It's so much pressure on kids now. It does them huge disservices because that whole idea of how much the value of your education is going is decreasing and it's bleeding into college now almost in certain fields of like there's whole ideas about why do certain majors even exist what do you gain out of that and i'm like but you've told them they have to go so now they're finding something to do with their time and that's not their fault i think of doing what they've been raised to do you have to perform well and you have to go to college and then you have to get a good job but now it trickles further and further up. And, and it leaves them less time with less time to explore. And figure out what they want to do with their life. I mean, if we don't give them the opportunity to draw something, mm-hmm. not as an assignment. Right. Just like be bored and draw something. Yeah. And there is no way for them to realize that, oh, Last time I was bored and draw something, I felt better. I felt like calmer. It, like, I felt engaged. So like, go back to that next time, next time. Now, every supposedly fun thing is prescribed. Yeah. You go to soccer, you, go to, you join this team, you join that right. club. I mean, you do this activity, you do this type of, you play this musical instrument based on this schedule. Yeah. Not anything else you, you don't explore. I mean, like all of those, you don't switch your second language. I mean. Uh, that that you're learning at school, this boredom. With people think it is bad. Yeah, it's a very interesting thing I recently learned in when I listen to podcasts that a lot of people are suggesting that boredom is a valuable experience. Yeah, it's not that you have to jam pack every activity possible to make sure a student is not bored or a kid is not bored even for five minutes. Yeah. Boredom is when you start, yeah, you can think of, we can be destructive. I mean, as to get bored and like yeah, open things, electronic parts at home that I was not supposed to, right. you know, yeah. but a lot came out of that. Yeah, some, yeah. I, did I break things that were valuable? Like I think I broke like our uh, uh, stereo system that we had just because I was overly curious, but that formed my passion of engineering. Yeah, definitely. Uh, boredom and play and unstructured yeah. play specifically. I mean, I still, the amount of time that I used to p- spend just outside with my siblings, we'd play house and we'd climb trees and all of that. It was definitely probably more structured than like stories I've heard my dad tell where like he and he was one of six. They were leave, come back when it's dinner time, go do whatever in the neighborhood. I mean, that doesn't happen anymore, but even playing in the front or backyard is still you, the creativity that is explored in that, that setting specifically, as opposed to, we're going to give you a doll or like, but even that doll house, color, you know? something to color and like an outline of something instead of just a blank page. Or my sister and I used to spend so much time, so much time expounding on the backstory of dollhouse that we would never actually get to play dollhouse. <laughs> We would name them all. What are the personalities? All of this history to each of our little characters. We had lists of names that we would go back to of like the the little doll with the black hair always gets picked from this little list and like that kind of stuff. But that's all still creative outlet of there's so much unstructure or like outlined of structure to dollhouse. You have characters and you make them do something. My poor brother, he, he was like, no, you can go do something else. Um, yeah. 
I mean, I destroyed my mom's daylilies playing hide and seek because I went and trampled a whole bunch of them hiding from, I think, like the neighbor's kid or something. And I remember her being very unhappy with me. Yeah. But yeah, we used to go knock on the neighbor's house. Does does he want to come out and play? We're going to go bike around the block and stuff. Yeah. And then, we, I mean, for, for someone with ADHD particularly, <laughs> that our joy is in our exploration and yeah. doing random things. That I mean, like the way I learn is by randomly exploring things, getting lost. I yeah. intentionally go to places that I did I want to be there or like, for example, particularly when we are traveling, I random neighbor, neighborhoods. I mean, I try to make sure that they are safe and things like that is daytime. But, and every single time, I mean, I found something that I wouldn't be able to find on the list of places to visit. Yeah. And yeah. that stayed with me from that trip more than the standard places right. that we were supposed to visit and take yeah. a picture of. Yeah. Those are important and i don't think if the way we are thinking about education is fully aligned with the way a wide group of students learn yes there is a big segment of the population that they may learn by just passively absorbing information yeah i mm -hmm. think yes there are people out there that they do work that way yes they can absorb information and when they are prompted they can repeat that to you yeah valuable mm -hmm. but how about those that they don't want any structure for their learning it's all about random play yeah one may argue it doesn't go anywhere yeah i mean it's not supposed to go anywhere in your elementary yeah. school age yeah in elementary i think it's supposed to be so much more about learning how you be a good person as a whole how you interact with other people how you interact with the world and like that's what play is for. That's how you experience yourself in the world and hanging upside down and like digging in the dirt, making mud pies. I did that all the time as a kid. I, I'm i still one of those people to help pick up worms and, and move them so that they're not on the sidewalk anymore. I did two this morning. <laughs> yeah. um, but like that kind of it's a different type of learning that I think is should be happening in kindergarten to elementary school. Academic stuff doesn't need to happen yeah. then, I don't think. And languages, I think, could because there's been extensive study to show that it's so much easier to learn when you start earlier. But even then, that doesn't need to be academic in style. It can just be immersive. Exposure. Yeah. Um, Immersion into an environment that they are watching like French movies or yeah. like something, I mean, Spanish, uh, something fun. Yeah. But they're staying in that room and they don't know Spanish, but I mean, that's how you form yeah. ideas. Being in an environment, I mean, like, we learned our first language, I mean, your mother tongue, essentially, by just being in that environment. Yeah. No one taught you English, or no one taught me Farsi, I and mean, yeah. I just grabbed it from the environment, you know? Exactly, so, yeah. I mean, we can spend all of this time talking about this, but I want to also make sure that we touch on, like, uh, your other experiences. So let's, let's transition gradually to your, like, uh, maybe... Um, middle school age and uh, see what is interesting. You can combine middle school and high school if there is nothing that distinctly right. draw a line. Well, so middle my middle school was very odd. I went to three different middle schools in three years. Um, I, so that one school I started elementary school at and then I went to public school for one year, seventh grade, and absolutely hated it. I didn't like going to school with boys. Academically, the school that I had been at was more advanced than typical public school. So even though I was in uh, the gifted program in public school, I was bored out of my mind. And if anybody is familiar with ADHD, boredom when you're trying to like be academic is the worst thing. I hated school that year. I remember in my seventh grade math class, we were going over a test that I had probably gotten a hundred on because I was essentially repeating my math class. And so I was reading Harry Potter under my desk. But teacher's pet Catherine was also sat right in front of the teacher because I always sat myself that way in classes that I enjoyed at least and my teacher saw me read it and I was not subtle about it but he saw my book and took it and threw it across the room and made me go stand in the corner because I wasn't paying attention to the review of the test that I hadn't gotten anything wrong on but I remember standing in the corner and trying so hard not to crack up laughing 
because I was like, what do you want me to do? Like, Mm -hmm. I got all the questions right. I don't need this review, so I'm going to do something else. Yeah. And so so middle school was odd. And then eighth grade, I, I moved to the school that I ended up graduating from high school with. And that's when I really started, all right, backtracking. I was diagnosed with ADHD at the end of fifth grade, beginning of sixth grade. Sixth grade is when I started, you know, I was taking medication and receiving accommodations for schooling was started in sixth grade. And at the same time, I was definitely still in the, you know, academically gifted programs. And into high school, the the school that I went to allowed me to do a lot of things academically that other schools wouldn't let you do. I took two math classes in ninth grade so that I could jump ahead a year. I did that both in ninth grade and in 11th grade. In 10th grade, I jumped into AP chemistry instead of taking a normal chemistry class because my mom knew that I'd be bored out of my mind in a normal chemistry class. Those kinds of things. But I was also still receiving all the ADHD accommodations. And I remember walking in to the extended time test room for taking the ACT. And because I'd been to so many different schools, I recognized like half the kids in this classroom and them all looking at me like, why are you here? What the heck are you doing here? You're in a whole bunch of AP classes. Why do you need a comment? Like ADHD is not for smart kids kind of feeling of like, but also having a breakdown to a bunch of teachers when like my diagnosis had lapsed or something about I needed to be retested on the adult guidelines or whatever and not being given my extended time for like end of semester exams and panicking because I knew I needed it and showing that I needed it because I didn't even get to like in my history exam the whole last 30 percent of the test wasn't even touched because I took needed my time um and then you know crying to teachers and all of that because I couldn't show my best performance still but that sort of dichotomy of intellectually knowing you know at least most of in in math and science classes knowing you know the information but needing the time to show and prove that math classes i almost always used my all of my time that i was given because i had learned by that point that i had to show every step of my work or something was going to go wrong and things like that you know like probably People who are watching this, they don't see that, but I can see that like your face is now showing some of that pain and emotion. I mean, like your facial gesture changed uh, just in front of me. And and that speaks to the deep impact it has had. I mean, like when we talk about PTSD and trauma, it doesn't need to be necessarily like a drastic event. I mean, like being in a car crash or something. Yeah. It can be a lot more subtle. Mm-hmm. enough to just change your mood at yeah. that moment. Let, let's stay here because it's very important if we unintentionally, unknowingly do something that it forms some of this traumatic experiences, again, like at a very new nuanced level. Yeah. The next time you go to that classroom, mm-hmm. if you are traumatized for any reason, during a test or for example you were embarrassed you felt shame it's very very difficult to undo it and perform well or continue building interest in the topic yes we our brain starts building a story around it that i don't belong here yeah i'm not good at that topic uh i have challenges like this is not this is not not my thing but at the end of the day your our brain is trying to protect us is trying to take remove us from that perceived harmful place Mm -hmm. we talk about attracting students to stem fields engineering like math i mean like we don't have many coming to stem fields there's just like there are major programs in different federal local agencies that they are trying to attract more and more students to come to stem fields there is no conversation around, okay, make them more fun. Yeah. It's all, okay, what can I add to it or how I can even more standardize it? And like, yeah. Uh, so what if we let comedians do that? I mean, to make it more fun. What if What if the secret is that the way we are doing it, it is not fun, period. What do you, ex- I mean, like a kid of that age is not, 
thinking about, okay, like if I go to this major, I can earn this much. It's just all about what is more fun for me to be interested in. We are making it super dull. I mean, like, for example, my daughter is in middle school and I, she's in the seventh grade and started the science topic. And Mm -hmm. I follow up with her once in a while, like, how, how do your homeworks look? I mean, like, and then I see it's all writing. Yeah. Like, describe this, explain the difference of this and this, or where did you, where do you expect to find this type of, you know, like, I don't know, animal or rock or whatever. There is nothing asking, like, draw something like this. Yeah. Or in a figure, Mm -hmm. show how these things are connected. Yeah. And in reality, that is how, I mean, when you look into a microscope, I mean, you don't see a text. Yeah. You see an image. Right. When we send James Webb Telescope, Mm -hmm. $10 billion project up there into the space, is not to collect books. Yeah written to us and we are exploring. I mean, it is to bring the highest resolution image. How much do we talk about importance of high resolution image or high quality illustration Yeah. when we are teaching those topics? Right. Nothing. Yeah. I mean, what we do is, oh, what's the distance of James Webb Telescope from the Earth? I mean, like how many moons were yeah. out it is? I'm like, okay, really? That is science? Yeah. Or some like interesting like science book I said like, Oh, this James Webb telescope is the size of this and weighs like an elephant. I mean, like, okay, that's important. Yeah. That's interesting. But like, it's out of context. Yeah. It's good to mm-hmm. bring them and hook them up. I mean, like, that's just, okay, listen to me. Yeah. It's a very cool thing. I'm talking. Right. But it's not that you stop there. Mm-hmm. I mean, okay, you got my attention. I mean, it's the weight of like an elephant. Okay, you yeah. got my attention. Yeah. I wonder sometimes if my view of science, and I am a scientist now, is like written in because so much of my family are scientists. A good at least 50, 60 percent of the adults in my family are in some sort of science math field. And so that amount of like, yeah, go look into whatever you're interested in, spend your time doing that was so much encouraged of like, I don't know how many pens I took apart and like that time that I spent playing in the dirt and like that's a really cool spider. What kind is it? Like kind of curiosity. I am a bit different in that I went into the biological fields, but that amount of like, yes, explore the sciences and all of that was so much more encouraged Mm -hmm. from my family that teachers I had. And I mean, some of my favorite teachers were my science teachers, but I think that happened because I came to them with the curiosity, not so much necessarily the other way around. The resources that my school had is very different from normal public schooling of like, my teachers didn't have 400 students that they have to keep track of and all of the weight and time that comes with that. So the the balance isn't the same. But my high school biology teacher, when I graduated, bought me a book off of Amazon because she thought I'd like it. It was like a book on the physics of music and musical instruments and stuff like that. And I was like, that's fantastic. I still have it. I, I don't think that that kind of interaction with teachers is something that the average student gets and yeah. which is really unfortunate because I feel like most teachers want that and aren't given the opportunity to do so because of the amount of stuff that gets piled on teachers yes. and then again like my mom being a teacher my aunt's a teacher that aspect of how much they want to help and encourage their students is there but they need I to think. go through this curriculum and yeah but they they have to teach to state standards and AP exams you have to teach to an AP exam and there's not nearly as much wiggle room given to them as i think they or the students wish for one of my biology classes we went out and collected i don't know what you call them up here roly polies or pill bugs and like collected a whole bunch of them like digging through rocks to find them it was an experiment on like how do you estimate the population of something so you count them, put white paint on their backs, release them next week, go back and collect a whole bunch more again. But that was a tangible, Mm -hmm. you're going out and picking up bugs. Yeah. And those kinds of like, I think I was really lucky in the teachers that I had that did things like that and- Kept your passion alive. Yeah, and very much encouraged it, especially my biology and chemistry teachers knew that I, and I pretty much knew by high school that that was where I wanted to go. But then, like, for me, the flip side was I didn't turn in English essays because I hated doing them. And it got to the point where I would actively hide from the English hallway so that I wouldn't see the teachers and feel the shame of not having turned in essays. And that was 
a lot of my high school experience, really. Was... How necessary was that? Those topics for what you're oh. doing today, how necessary was it? The same, the, the way that I'm not talking mm -hmm. about like English is not important. Yeah. The way it was being done. Oh. If, do you think if there was an education system that it was not part of the curriculum, it, the same way that, for example, you don't have mountain climbing in the yeah. curriculum, would that change anything for you, what you're doing today? I mean, there are pieces of it that I'd say I use, being able to read a text and extract out information, but that's not unique to English classes. Yeah. I, I take classes now about how to read a scientific publication and extract out. So, like, it didn't have to be in an English class. So just for the sake of English, class, yeah, it be and smartly incorporated in mm -hmm. things that they are actually not everyone who sits in an English class becomes an English professor, right? But yeah, like, the way we do it mm -hmm. is at the same for science and mathematics. Yeah, the same way teach math is as if this kid is gonna be the next mathematician. Mm -hmm. So this is the foundation we need to lay. Yeah, for that kid to become that no. This kid may need just enough math to use it in the, his daily life when he wants to become like, a, I don't know, like a businessman. I mean, like he wants yeah. to have a kind of a stronger math skill. Mm -hmm. But the way we're doing it is like as if everyone is going to go and become uh, a mathematician. The same is for English. I mean, I, yeah. can, I can see that mm -hmm. like it was just for the purpose of learning grammar. Yeah. And I will say, so the school that I went to up through sixth grade they were separate classes. We had in fifth and sixth grade, I had a literature class and then we had an English grammar class, which I mean, I enjoyed that English grammar class so much more because it was the, you know, mathy side of English. I remember like the diagram, I could diagram sentences out the wazoo. I loved doing that. Mm -hmm. But the literature class of like, what kind of symbolism do you think this author was using? And I'm like, who cares? <laughs> yeah. And who actually knows? The author's dead. They don't say anything. Like, <laughs> I do think I did have my senior year of high school, the English class that I was taking, it was much more geared towards like, where did, you know, Western culture come from? And it was a much more like cultural structure type class. That was fantastic. Yeah. Because it was not like reading stuff and extracting and writing an essay about what symbolism was used or like some sort of literature device. It was reading things and more like historical documents that became the foundation for American and Western European civilization. And that was great because understanding where stuff came from and how our culture works today, I think is super important. And like we read the Bible as a historical text rather than a religious text. And like where did these pieces actually come from and who wrote them and stuff like that. And I think that can be super critical just so that as an individual can approach society critically, um, yes. which I think is very important. But again, like reading Shakespeare and writing essays about it. And some, some kids some love, people it. love it. Yeah. And let them do it. Fine. Yeah. yeah. But does need to be for everyone. It's mm -hmm. not supposed to. I'm mean, like, yeah, I mean, they're the same way that Music is not for everyone. Dance is not for everyone. I enjoy music, but I have no musical talents. Right. Zero. So th th we, we infer all of these things. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, if you want to appreciate music, you need to learn all of the fundamentals yeah. and things like that. I can see their point, but and it may work for some people, but we have to constantly remind ourselves that there is a segment of the population that may not think this way, their neurology may not work this way. Yeah. Is our approach inclusive enough? Is our assumption causing discrimination against some learners, some right. styles of learning, thinking, interacting with the world? I'm not talking about personalities. No. It's yeah. much deeper than that. Yeah. And I think the world would be supremely boring if everybody thought the same way. We wouldn't get anywhere. The amount of ingenuity and different ways of thinking that were required to get the light bulb and like electricity, all of those things like that required a supremely out of the ordinary for their time way of thinking that's critical to society developing and moving forward with time and all of that. Absolutely. And if your education system leaves those kids behind, you're doing everybody in the society a disservice. And it's ironic that a lot of like those creative people, particularly you see that a lot on on the tech sector, mm -hmm. it is 
through it's not throughout education. Yeah. It they are dropouts. Yeah. A lot of them. I'm not suggesting at all that if you want to be successful, drop out. But right. that means that there is zero sense of belonging in that person. And the school system wasn't meeting their needs. Yeah. They thought they have a different mission. They have mm-hmm. a different vision. It's not going to happen through the school. I drop out. Yeah. Should they care? I think so. Because they they succeed. Yeah. But we don't talk about failures. Right. Yeah. That. For example, if we were able to teach them a little bit more about how to work with people, Mm -hmm. probably they wouldn't get to some challenges early on in their business or split apart, things like that, you know? So if they had learned more about like finances and things like that, they could have been problem. So isn't that, school should be an enabler. Yes. Right? And so an enabling, the definition of that is not to be able to solve an algebra problem it is not believe me i have i'm a professor in engineering yeah the number of days that i directly work with algebra they are very few really i use mathematics i mean like a lot but is a lot more than that mm-hmm. engineering is a lot more than it's just like this holistic formation of this holistic view of a problem yeah i mean like am i ignoring any assumption here is am i using all just these are very nuanced skills mm-hmm. that unless there is specific training, I mean, you can leave people in the wild and they explore and yell, yeah, and a lot of them get lost. I mean, right. like, so you can think about like your PhD program. Mm-hmm. I mean, like there is, there's a group of students that they can just figure it out yeah. on their own. And there are those that they need some type of more clo- like closer mentorship yeah. to be successful, right? They get discouraged if they fail frequently yes you know so do we have to lower the number of failures or frequency of them so Mm -hmm. they kind of like we can keep them around because they have talents and assets yeah i want to uh transition to your college years undergraduates and um the same thing i mean like if you draw a picture for us how it felt like uh one thing we didn't talk about, I mean, you mentioned creativity, but I want to, you to start thinking about like assets, unique skills that you were able to bring into some of classes that you took during undergrad. And also make sure you talk about what was there that really annoyed you, yeah. caused trouble for you. So I think what's great about college in general is that you are allowed to have your classes be much more tailored towards your interests which is helpful for, I think, pretty much everybody. And that also very much depends on what kind of school you go to, and there's a whole bunch of differences there. But knowing that I wanted to go into... Well, okay, granted, I thought that I wanted to be an engineer when I entered college. I thought I wanted to do something along the lines of bioengineering and sort of by happenstance fell into my actual degree in biochemistry. And I'm supremely thankful that I did. It ended up sitting where I wanted to go with my future much better than I think an engineering degree would have. So much of college is dependent on the professor and their style. Yes. I had professors that were fantastic because it was so much more of a, you don't, we're not going to make you memorize a whole bunch of the basic information. We want to know how well you use your information versus professors that were like, you're memorizing everything. I don't care. And that amount of switching back and forth was very difficult sometimes because I remember my first semester of organic chemistry the professor let us take in index cards to exams because no actual organic chemist has to memorize every single possible kind of reaction, whatever. But then second semester, that professor was like, no, you don't get notes. Like knowing that you still had to know all of organic one to do organic two, that class was a mess. The idea that we needed to memorize where NMR peaks were that nobody in the world memorizes for their actual job. It's like, that doesn't make any logical sense. But I was also able, and this was somewhat of my program, was designed for people that wanted to go into research. And so by junior, senior year, you were very much encouraged to work in a lab. And I did. I had both a job as like a lab tech for some income. And then I did undergraduate research in a different lab. And that was built into my curriculum as like, these are credit hours that you will do because you're all of us were pretty much expected to go to some sort of graduate school. That amount of time that I was able to dedicate to learning what real academic research looks like and both just the 
you know, maintenance side of you have however many biological samples you have to take care of and maintain and all of that at my job. And then in the research of like, this is what it looks like when you do research with animals and, and you know, when experiments fail. What because they the impact of that on um, keeping you engaged and interested? Oh, it was huge. I mean, I was definitely lucky in that the lab I did research in was not a super high strung lab yeah. because there are labs where and and one of my best friends had this experience of like the amount of rigidity that she experienced if it ended up putting her off of academic research and she's gone into industry which she's still doing research and stuff is just now at a biotech company because the amount of pressure for publications and all of that yeah didn't work for her and so that kind of skew can also happen but I mean, the lab, the grad students I worked for were, were fantastic. And my PI was also great in that I had my own little small project and I was able to troubleshoot sort of myself with guidance. And as an undergrad who hadn't done any of this before, that it's a big part of yeah. keeping somebody in research of like, here's how you troubleshoot because you will have to. It was really probably you assume thing. that everyone who has research experience is going to feel that way. I mean, like, this is, I mean, like, we think our, our, our subjecting experiences are universal. Yeah. That's how we talk. Humans yeah. be, um, uh, think the world, mm -hmm. world uh, works. But uh, also, I want to mm -hmm. take this opportunity to thank the National Science Foundation for supporting us to hold, through their REU program, Research for Undergraduate Student Program, to hold two sites, uh, the first site, I was the PI for, and the focus was on bringing students with ADHD and dyslexia to, to, to join engineering lab 10 weeks of summer. And at first that I wrote the proposal, my idea was to provide them with an opportunity which they may not traditionally have because they typically do not have those kind of like uh, shiny GPA scores or they are hesitant. I mean, like Submitting an application is not fun for me. I mean, no. like this is one of the yeah. I mean, forms, tax, I mean, things like writing an essay. Of like, it's the last thing I want to do in the yeah. world. I'm passionate about it, mm -hmm. joining a group or doing something. But when I click on something and say, oh my God, who's going to submit this application package? That really throws me off. Mm -hmm. And so the idea was to really kind of encourage those students that they may not get the opportunity or it might, it might not be trivial or easy for them. For example, one of the things that we did was that they could submit a three-minute video describing their mm -hmm. interest in joining the program rather than writing an essay Fantastic. in the application. So, and the second time, uh, my, my colleague, Dr. Alexandra Hain, is running the program, and we are using all of the experiences we gained from the previous side. And again, I'm thankful of the National Science Foundation for supporting us uh, strongly. What I want to say is that we, this is not enough. This one site, one isolated program is not enough. We are actually working on a qualitative paper. We got to run a small qualitative study with the participants because, again, I had some idea that they're going to like research environment, those that they have ADHD, because we are more of explorers rather than exploiters. I mean, like if we think about like two search philosophies. Yeah toward generating knowledge. I mean, like, you, you you have two strategies of exploitation and exploration. I mean, like, we are more of on the exploration side. And ironically, all the education system is teaching you how to become a good exploiter. And yeah. So we are, we are working on that qualitative paper, and there is solid evidence now that, indeed, they learn better in this environment. They the depth. I mean, like we had students who had a course just a semester before joining, like circuit design, and then they joined and did this thing and said, "I just realized what this is about." Yeah. Oh, just mm -hmm. just this experience was the initiation of their understanding of the topic, not the course that they successfully passed. Right. So definitely, we are. Yeah trying to encourage more of, and because people ask me sometimes, I mean, like, okay, if you're talking about all of these, like, traits and habits that ADHDers have, mm -hmm. what kind of education system then can be designed to help them? I was like, first of all, we don't need to necessarily start something over. I mean, we can make adjustments mm -hmm. to, to a good extent. And then adding, I mean, like, they can take more credits 
doing yeah. research rather than classroom. I mean, yeah. not letting them, I mean, for example, in our curriculum, we limit the number of independent study classes that they can okay. take with their, at, with, mm -hmm. uh, during undergrad. It doesn't count toward their graduation. Okay. But if it is a structured, if it is done ethically, mm -hmm. so it is not just like they sign up for the class, they don't do anything, they yeah. get passed. We have to think more creatively and also we have to be more open-minded mm -hmm. when it comes to things like that. Maybe there is no way you can change a classroom setting to serve like this highly creative, want to engage in like explorative tasks and learn by just exploration. There is no design in a classroom that can achieve that. Maybe we have to think out uh, beyond classroom. Yeah. Education 2.0 type thing. Again, like this made sense at some age. I mean, mm -hmm. that there was one teacher. I mean, like kids, they needed to come and sit and learn. There was no resource. So everything needed to be talked about. And there was yeah. one book that they had to kind of borrow yeah. from the library. That, that made sense at mm -hmm. that age. But now we are just adding like more digital aspects to this. I mean, incorporating VR, AR, I mean like, but what if the answer is not classroom to begin with? Well, so thinking about it now, I think most of the, you know, biological knowledge that I have now, I learned because I worked in a lab where I needed to know it. And so like, in order to understand whatever question we were after, I went and then read a whole bunch of stuff, took my little notes, and then like, now I remember it because I had to use it in order to understand what I was doing. I'm thinking now about how much of the information that is in my head do I actually remember from my academic classes that I took in college. And there's definitely some. Far more of the information that I use, I learned on the job almost. Yes. That's like, in order to understand whatever I was doing, I had to sit down and learn X, Y, Z. So I did. It's For me, it's almost taking advantage of a hyper-focus or like special interest of the day or whatever of... I need to know this and I'm interested in it. So I'm going to now all of a sudden, I guess not really all of a sudden, but like there's a purpose to learning it now rather than to appease some teacher that's going to give me a test and that kind of stuff. I'm going to use it now. And that makes it so much more interesting to learn. And this is again, like you realize that now when now you go back critically, try to, oh, what's the source of that information? Yeah. If I want to re 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 think about like a, uh, clear concept where did I acquire from I mean, yeah. like it was it a classroom when the instructor was showing me a slide or when I was uh, struggling to figure something out yeah. because of my experiments you know so and that is that is very common yeah uh, for ADHD learners that and and I think it is more we can we can safely say it is beyond ADHD. It is also I mean, dyslexia, neurodiversity in general. Even some someone with anxiety, yeah, with some neurological basis, not just feeling anxious. Even those people that they're considered also neurodiverse, maybe outside classroom level. I mean, you can generate less anxiety. Yeah, and then the person's bandwidth becomes available to learn, to engage. It, I think it's very important that we, as I said, think much broader than what we, how we think today about changing our education system radically. When I talk to other university professors or teachers, when they think about teaching innovation, everything is in the context of a traditional classroom setting. Yeah. Which there are two populations. One is like students are there to learn. The teacher that is there to inject yeah. knowledge. Mm -hmm. And what if they are there to just interact with each other and explore something? Mm -hmm. There is no intellectual hierarchy. Yeah. So the the teacher's role is to just guide the experience. Right. And I wonder sometimes if how beneficial would it would be for the education system to allow for like purposeful failure almost. Mm -hmm. Because I, now that I'm doing what I do, stuff fails all the time. And in, in adulthood, stuff fails all the time. And I feel like so much of schooling does not allow for that That's to happen. True. You fail, you're screwed. And I wonder if, and so much more learning happens at the failure and recovering from that failure. All of the stuff that I learned trying to troubleshoot whatever experiment wasn't happening correctly was learned because we were trying to fix a failure. Yes. And... I mean, and that also helps so much more with perseverance. I mean, I spent six months trying to get something done and it never happened. And then being like, okay, 
we can safely now put this aside and move forward with something else. If you give up at the first failure, you don't get anywhere. That's absolutely, this is, this is brilliant what you're bringing up. Uh, our, our education system is indeed failure averse. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it discourages failure. At, and that's the whole purpose of it. You get the highest grade. Yeah. Uh, rather than thinking of an exam as a way for you to explore mm-hmm. the areas that more learning is needed to be acquired. It is the end of the line. It should happen day one. <laughs> should yeah. you think about that. And then that essentially guides your way through the semester that these are the areas maybe that, that they need more work or and these types of exposure they may kind yeah. of give you that knowledge that was identified as lacking, you know? Yeah. Rather than okay, I mean like very good student and mm-hmm. let me see how good you were. And yeah, like in the scale of zero to hundred. Mm-hmm. I mean you were seven percent good. So yeah. It is very important that we educate people not how to win. This winning culture is just like tr- terrible. Yeah. It is tearing people apart, lives apart. I mean, like just this idea that we have to always win. So, and like it not under, sorry, sorry, but okay. not understanding that, first of all, I mean, our winning is at the cost of someone else's losing. <laughs> I mean, so if it is like a non zero sum game or a zero sum game, actually, more important than winning and knowing the correct answer at that moment is. If you have built some resilience, how to deal with setbacks properly. Mm -hmm. That is important. Yes. Because there are always setbacks in real life. Yeah. It's just like reality of life. We are not going to go out, graduate, we always win because we have PhD. Yeah. No, there are setbacks. Yeah. There are mess ups. Mm -hmm. There are terrible things. The way you deal with Mm -hmm. is what makes or breaks it. Yeah. People who persist to stay or just go back to another... Like Edison's light bulb. I mean, like how many times they failed until they yeah. got it. I mean, like so we're not teaching that skill. Mm-hmm. It that is a taboo. I yeah. teach you how to fail and stand up again. I mean, like yeah. that that's not part of the curriculum. So. Right. Well, and I remember the first time I had like a real serious mess up in college, and it had bad consequences. And I lost my spot in the honors college, and calling my dad and being like. I don't know what to do about this. And him telling me about an expensive mistake that he had made and realizing that my parents had done stuff like that too. Like that realization that, oh, dad has made a mistake like this. Clearly dad is fine now. Like it's not the end of the world. Realization was definitely a a real sort of pivot point of me learning how to manage myself. It was both in like the event itself, a big red flag of you have got to figure something out to manage yourself because this can't happen again but also talking to my dad about yeah i've done something like that and it was expensive and i had to fix it was such like a reassuring dad could fix it like and which means i can fix it too like idea of i haven't lost everything and yes. now okay this sucks i have consequences but i can move forward from this and not keep hanging on to this thing that happened and kind of idea and that really was this was the end of freshman year of college i was like okay we're gonna we have to take stock what do i struggle with what do i need to do to or start trialing for how do you handle yourself because you don't work like everybody else and uh, i've now have habits that i've kept in place since then that work reasonably well for myself for me i feel like i had to have that failure first that was necessary for me to gain the realization of You need to figure something out yeah because i had been whatever intelligent enough or had enough support to sort of skate by before that with hiccups but this was the first time that it was a real adult serious thing having the smaller ones beforehand meant that i didn't completely fall apart at this one but it was necessary i feel like to my development as an adult let's stay there a little longer because there's a very important point I want to unpack a little bit here because again like you may people who are listening to this may think that's not unique to ADHD this is something that we all experience so yes I mean experiencing setback and all the undesired feeling that comes with it this is across the board everyone feels that way so it's not unique to 
someone with ADHD, but what is unique to someone with ADHD, and it's based on my, my experience of talking to a lot of individuals, is that this proportionate level of emotional experience that we have to adversity. I think the first time that I started having like real like emotional, emotional, overwhelming feelings was probably in high school. I started really struggling in 11th grade and there were lots of factors to this. I definitely overwhelmed myself in terms of the academics I was trying to get done. I was having some physical health problems as well and we had just switched my medication regime to be every day instead of just on school days and that came with its side effects as well but I started really really struggling with keeping up with everything. I'm not succeeding now Am I meant to go that far? Because the only vision I'd ever had of my adulthood was going through college and, and I didn't hadn't really thought much past that yet, but like, which meant that I had to succeed in high school. Those feelings of if I'm not making it now, what does that mean? I, back then I was still much more religious than I am now and God's plan and all, like, I didn't have an explanation. And then, you know, I, I got past that phase of my life. But then again, that freshman year of college, I had just one month where again, I was very overwhelmed in terms of my workload. And when you go to college, there's so much more you have to manage about yourself that used to be done, like your laundry. And I started having problems getting myself to shower regularly and remembering to eat and stuff like that, that yeah. Those kinds of, you're an adult now. Yeah. Um, it becomes a last priority. Yeah. But even like things like my exercise had been structured up to that point because I was in dance classes through high school. I got very lucky. My best friend through college sort of was like, have you eaten today? Because there was, I had gone like 24 hours without eating and then like almost passing out and she whacked me across the head and was like, sit down. Those kinds of like almost short depressive episodes came about when I had so far overstretched myself that everything was falling. Like, I felt like everything was falling apart. I didn't know how to manage all of that. And it wasn't until I, like, took a break, recovered, and started figuring out, okay, here's how to, like, take some of that weight off of my brain trying to remember everything. In college was when I started making writing down my to-do list to alleviate the mental pressure of trying to remember everything in your head and all of that that I felt like I should have been able to do and I felt like most normal people don't remember that like forget to eat I mean I learned the power of having a good cry um crying to somebody not for the purpose of crying but just having that release off of my chest I remember having Um, My brain plays music in my head a lot. Um, I'm either listening to it or there's something, some sort of like DJ mismatched, something happening in my head. But it felt like a funeral march in my head. And I I couldn't sleep. The stress was affecting my body. And I remember calling my dad and just being like, I don't like any of this. And I feel like my head's going to whatever. And just having a good like half hour cry on the phone with him and he'd be like, do you think you can go to sleep now? I'm like, yeah, I think I've I've cried myself enough that I'm tired enough and my brain shut up enough to go to bed. And I, I've done that now with my mom a couple times as well. And I feel like now I've matured enough as an adult to not be worried about revealing those feelings to my mom the way that I think I had when I was a teenager. I felt like with my mom, I had struggled so much more to express why I was upset with her. I remember we had briefly mentioned about like how writing applications is a nightmare and college application season. I mean, this is what my mom did with her career. And when she'd asked me like, why aren't these done yet? Me not being able to verbalize why and crying and why crying? I don't know. Lost of destroying that good kid image. Yeah. And I mean, I would, I, it didn't get into a lot of the schools that I applied to probably because a lot of where my intelligence lay is not in written grades. I mean, yes. I tested really well on standardized tests, but I mean, if you looked into where my grades actually sat, there were gaps, at least on paper. I'm very happy with where I went to college and I'm happy to be here now, but like I didn't get into most of the grad schools I applied to nor most of the undergrad schools I applied to. Because I'm not a traditional student. <laughs> like, I'm kind of a traditional transcript. Yeah. An application um, package. And and this is something we, and I can list the priorities that I have mm-hmm. uh, to support this kind of mindset shift. 
having a communication with our admissions office. Mm -hmm. I understand they're overloaded. They're receiving every year more application than the year before. But we have to ask ourselves, what is the cost here? It's not making a mistake here and there and admitting or not admitting a person. It's just like cutting out a segment of learners. Yeah. All together. Those that they don't have, they can record. Probably if I have asked you to, okay, can you write your experiences and send it to me? I want to publish it on a blog. Yeah. I would have never received from you anything. I'm probably, but you're having this yeah. deep conversation that shows that this is your preferred mode of communication. Yeah. That's how you can express yourself. Mm -hmm. It's not that I ask you to find time to write something. I mean, like asking someone to write an essay. Yeah. My daughter, for example, has a very interesting take on this. She says, like, I don't want to talk about myself. I have no problem writing, but mm -hmm. it makes it very uncomfortable to talk about myself. Yeah. And I see that all of those kids are writing like those braggy, you know, paragraphs about themselves and exaggerating. I don't want to even talk about myself. So, okay, like. She's pretty articulate and like, mm -hmm. I, I know that writing is not her difficulty or challenge, but that's who she is. Yeah. That shouldn't put her at disadvantage mm -hmm. in any way. So our admissions offices, they need to be more careful about if any of those practices that we think they're just given, it's been always like this, it's efficient, it is the only way that we are dealing with so many applications we receive, if they are marginalizing any mm. population. I definitely feel that adverseness to writing about yourself. It was the worst part of all my applications, it's even, even with grad school. Grad school, some schools, it was all in one piece where you wrote about yourself and your research background. And in other schools, they were separate, where I could write about, you know, this is what I've done research-wise. Here's what we did, why we did it, all of that. That was fine. But why are you interested in this school? I'm like, because I want to go to grad school what do you want from me? Like, Story. kind of, yeah. But I wonder now if part of how I ended up here at UConn was because of the interview process. And one of the professors I interviewed with devolved into like a, I'm complaining about stuff's not working at, at my lab. And she's like, try these things. It, it became a discussion about science and troubleshooting, not why do you want to come to UConn kind of thing. And as scientists, that's what you do with most of your time. And so... Don't write essays. <laughs> yeah. I became interested in genetics at, you yeah. know, whatever years old, like, which is in my applications. I loved the story that I had there. I learned genetics by mating together candy. But it was one of those fantastic teachers that taught you in a hands-on way. You had a blank worksheet, mate your candy together. What do the babies look like? Now what kind of, like logically think through what kind of inheritance it was fantastic and that was the majority of my personal statement yeah. because i didn't know what else to put because yeah. i again like i'm very much not comfortable saying good things about myself because it feels like bragging i'll talk about my siblings and i'll talk them up to anybody because they're fantastic and they're smart and i know all these things but like i will often tell people that i'm the least smart of my siblings even though i know i'm perfectly smart i'm in a phd program and all of that but my siblings' achievements to me seem much more profound. Yeah, yeah. And I, I mean, totally get what you're talking about. They're my siblings, but like experiences. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's uh, completely. I mean, like it's tangible for me. I'm, I'm thinking if it has to do with ADHD, it's just like our personality that has some yeah. similarity. But, but definitely, I mean, again, like given that ADHD experiences they have had to do with how we form our self image, I, I don't think it can be excluded mm -hmm. from that. So. Uh, this is actually a good time to transition to uh, your graduate school experience. Now, you are doing something that you're passionate about. Yes. Uh, I know, again, like I don't want to picture a glamorous like view of grad school. It has its own challenge. It has like boring tasks. Actually, quite a bit of that. Is yeah. Like that. But at least there is what matters is fun. Yeah. Which is your creativity, figuring out. The, the answer to the question, mm -hmm. testing hypothesis, running experiments, things like the troubleshooting things. I want to focus on the advisor advisee relationship. Right. And we don't need to talk about subjective experiences. I want to think you think more broad about like that relationship, which is defining on your level of, I mean, that what's the thing is, for example, like how successful you're going to be in your graduate program. 
how strong a relationship is and also how fruitful it is, how the, the right. how healthy that dynamic is. Yeah. When I interacted with my own students, I had this general understanding in mind that they may have the same challenges I, I, I experienced. So I was a little more on understanding, but I still can think of like moments that my reaction or expectation was not informed by that might be just a difference mm -hmm. in the way people function. Mm -hmm. I want you to comment on that and then picture how an ideal advisor for someone with ADHD looks like. Right. When I sort of decided what lab that I thought I wanted to join before committing, I had a conversation with my PI. Like, Look, this is something that I have. Here are some of the trends that I know I'm prone to. Do you think you can? You had that? I did because I knew that it would impact a lot of it for me. And I, my experience is a little bit unique in that I joined a brand new lab. There weren't any current, I'm the first PhD student that this PI has. So I was approaching this knowing that she had not mentored a PhD student through this process yet before. And she's also different in that she's new to the U.S. school system. She did her PhD in Europe and did her postdoc here in the States, but a postdoc's essentially just a job. Yeah. So... That was something that I felt from the outset that it would be very important to just be open about all of this. And we had very good productive conversations about it then and since then of her figuring out what her mentorship style is and if that's consistent from person to person and what I what my needs are from her and just in general. But so that was something that I think I knew coming into grad school was going to be a conversation I needed to have. Interesting. But I will say, I think I knew that because I spent two years in a research lab full time before starting grad school. If I had come directly from undergrad, I don't know if I would have known that. Because I hear a lot of students that the same way that they don't discuss that with their instructors, mm -hmm. they don't stop by to tell them about what their learning habits or, yeah. they, or for example, if explain like if something is late or wasn't submitted i mean like what what could be the root cause of it i yeah. think we don't do this and they come to grad school with the same mindset that you mm. don't have this conversation yeah it's all like okay what's the next thing that needs to be done what is expected of you when you go to the next meeting or what's expected to be delivered end of the month mm -hmm. six months so that is where conversations happen and there is no personal experience hear part of the conversation. Yeah. And I definitely do think that if I had come to grad school directly from undergrad, because I never had a conversation like that with my undergraduate PS. I had conversations like that with the people that I worked with. I worked at the NIH for two years and had conversations like that with the person I was working with there. And because grad school is complete, it's a completely different beast from undergrad yes. of you're not Right now I'm taking a handful of classes, but the majority of my time is not structured the same way. And so having those two years of full-time research experience of this is what your life will look like in grad school was very integral to me realizing what my struggles were going to look like in all most likely and what checks and balances I needed from the people around me. And so I think that was definitely integral to me knowing that that was a conversation I needed to have at the beginning with whatever PI, because if I feel like a lot of people with neurodivergencies or stuff spend so much time either masking or hiding or whatever so that they can function as quote unquote normally as possible, because there are so many stigmas against it and all of that. I knew that the problems were going to happen regardless. And if I was going to have a PI that would blow up about them or I didn't want to enter into a shame cycle. Yeah. And so I just decided to. And I think you did the right thing mm -hmm. and that is what we are learning. And as part of the proposal that is actually that the project is supporting to the, this podcast is to identify the challenges and figure out what uh, can be done. Uh, and this is uh, over and over this piece of data is emerging that communication helps communication that is supported by self-advocacy so yeah. we need to empower students to have a conversation 
the communication that doesn't happen from a deficit view. Mm -hmm. That, oh, I have these challenges and then accommodate me. No, I mean, like, yeah. we don't, we can't expect the person to understand that these are real challenges. These are not excuses. Mm -hmm. I mean, and then unfortunately, the defi default idea is that you're coming in with some excuses for something yeah. not happening. Or, mm -hmm. So, shaping a holistic view in the mind of advisors, I think is very important. And it, it can go as far as citizens communicating with their advisors what they are good at. I mean, like what kind of activities, like for example, is it behind the bench type of mm -hmm. activity or is it like computer simulation or field work? I mean, yeah. like the, it, again, like we all have preferences, but selling the idea that this is, you can get my creative self. Mm -hmm. And if you want like, novel ideas if, if you want to get work done yeah. i can do simulation for you right and like again stay committed drink another cup of coffee and it'll run this for you but like yeah. if you really want my creative mind mm -hmm. let me fix problems i mean yeah. let me help others i mean like that they are getting some results that they're like noisy or it's mm -hmm. not like reliable like help with those yeah. and like I've, I've had students i mean again like their contribution to helping other students was as significant as their own project. It's not extra work. It is when the student realizes that you are needed here, mm -hmm. the sense of belonging that it provides to you. Yeah. You know, that helps you to be more motivated about your project, your own yeah. project, you know, that sense of being critical, being dispensable. Yeah. It's a very valuable sense for us to have. And having a conversation with an advisor that this is what I can bring to the table and I think it is unique. Yeah. So that is very important. And, you know, like someone art out there may argue that like not everyone is accommodating of this and not, not every advisor thinks that way. Mm -hmm. Then maybe you need to think about another person. Yeah. Maybe that advisor is perfect, mm -hmm. is an excellent researcher for a more standard student. Yeah. So... It's not that people are bad or good. Mm -hmm. You have the choice to work with someone yeah. that is more understanding. And I think it is critical that they will understand me. Yes, definitely. I've noticed, especially with the classes I'm taking right now, two of them is about you know attending somebody's presentation and asking questions right there in person. And I'm fine. I've never had problems doing that. That on the spot connection of different ideas, that's something that I know is a, a big strength yeah. of mine. And my PI knows that as well. It comes up when we have our own lab meetings and like she's fantastic in that she knows this about me and tells me that she knows this about me, which I don't want to call it an ego boost, but it, it, yes, it, it is it a bit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Realizing that that is something that a lot of my peers struggle with and being like, oh, I've never shown that to Called with on a spot. I mean, yeah. that's the question I got. I'm like, how can you connect these things? I mean, like you learned this in that class and then you had that observation in the field. Yeah. How do you form the relevance of these things? Like, leave me, it is completely unintentional. Yeah. It just comes up. I mean, I, mm -hmm. it's not that I'm smart and I'm so kind of like intellectually capable that I can like do this thing. It's just like yeah. a, it just happens. Yeah, I've tried to explain it to my PIs. Like, I feel like most neurotypical neurotypical people, when they learn information, it gets filed. If you want to put visual to it, like a filing cabinet. I don't have a filing cabinet. I have an open closet of just stuff shoved. And if I open it, everything comes out. Yeah. So there's no boundaries between yeah. stuff. When I'm hearing a presentation about not my field of biology, I can still instinctively connect my field of biology to it because there's not a wall there. Yes. And I don't... Extremely valuable in the research enterprise. Yeah. In a classroom setting, there is that, again, you know, like you're mm -hmm. just think about the problem like this way. I mean, like, or this is the, this is the standard approach. For courses, it's understandable, but with, with research, actually, we want exactly that. I yeah. mean, like, that if you can, we talk about interdisciplinary research, we think we talk about like bringing ideas from other fields or other labs or other kind of like, I don't know, sciences to our science to be able to solve problems. And that is exactly what we what yeah. are pretty good at. Again, like this is not only your experience. I'm telling you that like it is almost the valid for ADHDers that I've worked with mm -hmm. across the board that yeah. I are not short of instantaneous ideas coming up on a spot mm -hmm. 
-hmm. Again, it, it, the, the environment needs to be safe. Yes. Otherwise, they don't feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. I mean, they just like kill each other down right there. I mean, yeah. like if they think it is valued, they can generate ideas. Well, so I, a philosophy that I've made for myself and I try to keep with the students I TA is that there's no such thing as a dumb question. It's not a thing. There are there can be silly questions, but there is no such thing as a dumb question because to me, if you're asking a question, that means you want to learn. And there is that is always a good thing. So I don't know if I've just internalized that enough to where I don't feel the like wariness of asking a question, but it's something that I try to teach the students that I TA of like, ask anything. I don't care if it's been asked five times before or if it isn't relevant or whatever. It's a question and it's valuable. And so I wonder if you mentioned the, the space needing to be safe. And I wonder now if I just feel like asking questions anywhere is always safe. Because yeah, so I try to internalize some yeah. of those things that we believe in and we teach to other people. We talk. I mean, like we, we if we don't do it ourselves, yeah. actually, it is empty. Yeah, that that I think has to do with it. But also, your impre everything is about impression, not mm -hmm. the action. I mean, some people like to do anything to discourage that. But yeah. you know, whatever happened, the person doesn't have the impression of being in a safe place, yeah. and it's not gonna speak out. Right. It's not gonna express his or her opinion. Anymore. Yeah. So it happened. I mean, like, it doesn't mean that you, it was the outcome of a wrongdoing or something like disastrous that happened. It's yeah. just like it, this impression is formed. Mm -hmm. Either there is a dominant voice in the classroom or there's just like they had you in the class and they know how strict you are now right. that you're sitting in this thing is outside the classroom, but they're bringing that mindset of classroom yeah. to this and all of those things, you know, so it has formed that impression that maybe for a student, then we're scared of expressing that ideas if we think their level of stupidity is more than 50%. Right. And like how many of those transformative ideas are in the region of the spectrum that stupidity is like 70%, 80%, honestly, yeah. in there. And that's where transformational ideas are. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it would be just like a good solution. Yeah. Transformation. Right. I'm, I'm trying to be cognizant of your time and if we start wrapping up by you know i can sit in here all day yes listen yeah. to you it's just like so insightful if we if you think of your i'm gonna ask two questions but in the same context uh one is six seven year old self what kind of advice you would after like living a very successful life what kind of advice you would give to that fourth grader yeah third grader mm -hmm. i think i'd probably say something along the lines of explore your surroundings and grades are not as important as people make them out to be i spent so much time agonizing over grades and they're not the end all be all that i think a lot of people would have them be i wasn't necessarily agonizing over them at that age but in that girl's future self yes now that you look back yeah it was a matter yeah, I had several hiccups in my grades and I'm still here and doing well. So, yeah. And then think about your undergraduate self. Right. Thinking about, I mean, like junior, senior year, thinking about what's next. Well, so first I'd tell them, don't apply to grad school yet. Because I did. I applied my senior year, didn't get in anywhere. But having that two-year gap that I had was definitely important to knowing what to do in grad school. So... That, that'd be the first thing is don't apply yet. Get some, you know, real research experience first and learn what research actually is like because I don't know that I would have liked it nearly as much as I do now. How would you tell them about the way their grades may reflect their potential in doing research or being a successful researcher? Again, I'd say that, you know, you had your hiccups, but you've shown a lot of growth. And that's the really important part of you didn't have the hiccup and get stuck down at the bottom of that hill and, and to keep moving up the hill, moving forward and, and do go where you want to go with your science and all of that. People will want you there. Thank you. So thank you very much, Catherine, for being with me today. I, I really enjoyed talking to you when we met first time to talk about this podcast. I had this feeling it's going to be a great conversation yeah. and a lot of interesting things that you can really share with, with the audience. And, and I really appreciate that you spent Absolutely. this 
large block of your time to be here. I know students at your level are super busy. Every hour counts. And that, that means a lot. And please stay in touch. And Absolutely. We definitely Absolutely. are going to continue this conversation. For sure, yeah. I, I, and I'm glad that I came, really. It's something that's important to me and is worth my time. Absolutely. So, yeah. Thank you. This concludes another episode of our podcast. At the end, I want to again thank National Science Foundation for supporting our efforts. And I really hope that by giving platform to non-traditional learners like K-Train, we can really raise awareness around the topic of neurodiversity and encourage more students to consider higher level academic careers and pursuits. I also want to ask you to subscribe so you get notification when we release the next podcast and also share this with people who you know, your siblings, your family, your friends, that they may be experiencing some of the challenges or maybe they are successful, but they you think that there might be something in here that could be of benefit to them. Please subscribe and share this and I look forward to our next episode. Bye.